Welcome to today's webinar on Low Impact Development, funded by the Department of Ecology. My name is Katherine Taylor and I will be facilitating the webinar today. Today's topic is Plants for Low Impact Development and our presenters are landscape architect Peggy Gaynor and ecologist Len Ballack. These webinars have been created in partnership with the Washington Association of Landscape Professionals, or WALP, and the Washington State Nursery and Landscape Association, or WSNLA. If you are not already a member or are not familiar with these organizations, please visit their websites for a lot of great resources. These organizations also have magazines in which they are featuring four articles between the months of April and August on low impact development. Before I pass the webinar over to today's presenters, I'm going to talk about low impact development, how it helps to manage stormwater, and the upcoming regulation changes that will affect the use of low impact development on develop new development and redevelopment projects in Washington State. LID, or low impact development, is an approach to managing stormwater that helps to protect water quality, reduces or slows runoff amounts, restoring groundwater recharge, and healthy habitats. Some of the techniques included in low impact development are rain gardens, which are shallow depressions with amended soils and vegetation designed to mimic forest floors that absorb and filter stormwater. Bioretention facilities, which are much like rain gardens, but are engineered and modeled to store and treat a specific amount of water. Permeable pavements, which have voids in its structure intended to allow passage of water through the pavement and into the ground. Roofs or walls layered with waterproofing materials, growing medium, and vegetation designed to help slow water, and rainwater harvest harvesting systems, which use barrels or cisterns to capture rainwater for, for uses like irrigation or flushing toilets. So why are we using LID and why is stormwater bad? Well, stormwater run runoff is the result of rainfall on impervious surfaces such as roads and rooftops where it picks up pollutants and carries them to local waterways. Stormwater runoff is one of the largest sources of pollutants in urbanized areas of Washington State and is the largest contributor of pollutants entering the Puget Sound. Stormwater runoff can lead to erosion, as you can see in the top right photo, pollution of soils and water bodies, sedimentation, combined sewage overflows, and loss of wildlife habitat. Through these principles of conserving trees, plants, and healthy soils, and minimizing impervious, impervious surfaces, native vegetation loss, and stormwater runoff, LID strives to manage stormwater where it falls, increasing the area and distribution of stormwater infiltration, thereby reducing its concentrated entry into water bodies. LID has many benefits, the most important of which are that it reduces and slows stormwater runoff, protects water quality, and restores ecosystem services. Stormwater is regulated by the Clean Water Act, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, the Washington State Department of Ecology, and by municipal permits. Regulatory changes are coming to Washington State. The Department of Ecology is making regulatory changes to stormwater management and the use of LID to address the negative impacts of stormwater in our urban and natural landscape. Regulation changes will take place between 2015 and 2018, with most cities and counties adopting changes by 2016. In Western Washington, regulations will require the use of low-impact development on new development or redevelopment projects like housing or commercial developments to help manage stormwater on site. In eastern Washington, the use of LID will simply be allowed. Each city and county will decide on how to adopt these changes. The Department of Ecology stormwater regulations will be the minimum. Some cities and counties may decide to expand upon these regulations. Check with your local planning departments to understand exactly how these regulations will be applied in your area. Because cities and counties are currently determining how they will adopt these new regulations, now is a good time to get in touch with your local officials to give your input on how these regulations should take effect. The Municipal Research and Services Center of Washington is a great resource for finding the right officials to contact. Contact officials in the planning departments of your cities and counties to gain a greater understanding of how these changes will affect you. 
Our first presenter today is Peggy Gaynor, landscape architect. She will speak about plant selection for low impact development. Peggy has been working with LID since the 1980s before the term LID even existed. She combines a background in architecture, art, classical music, and science to solve site problems with multifaceted, cutting edge, and ecologically based design solutions. She has worked on a variety of projects including habitat restoration, open space preservation, water conservation, and creek daylighting. Our second speaker today is Len Ballack, who will be speaking about native plant propagation. He is currently an ecologist at Herrera Environmental Consultants where he works on wetland mitigation and restoration, bioengineering techniques for stream bank stabilization, habitat enhancement, native plant seed collection and propagation planning, and the investigation of innovative restoration techniques. Before working at Herrera, Len helped to found Bitterroot Nursery and Restoration to provide plants for restoration projects. Now I'll turn this over to Peggy. Thank you very much, Catherine. So Peggy Gaynor here with Gaynor Inc. to talk to you about plants for low impact development, but specifically also plants, native plants for sustainable design and development in general. I think it can be broadly applied, all of the concepts we're going to talk about here. And uh, while we sit on this slide, see if you can identify any of these native plants that are pictured. They will be identified later in the, pr in the program. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I've been uh, working as a sustainable person, and it wasn't called that in the early 80s, but I've been uh, practicing landscape architecture since the 70s and applying ecological principles to my designs and solutions uh, since that time and, and coming up doing daylightings, creek daylightings, wetland restorations, habitat restorations in the urban context long before many people were doing so, and that was met with quizzical looks at best and sometimes outright derision uh, with comments such as, that's not landscape architecture. So it is all very, very interesting for me to see this ama amazing shift towards sustainability since that time, since the 80s and even early 90s. Uh, and also quite interesting and amusing to see the proliferation of initiatives and um, uh, programs and on to the next slide, which I just show a very few here, a tip of the iceberg, because more are coming out every month, uh, and it's, it, it really is quite amazing. But what I really want to point out, and we can go through a few of these programs, and it, but you may be familiar with some of these, is that do not be daunted or intimidated by all these official looking names and all this stuff because it has always been permitted. It has always been allowed to be sustainable, to act sustainably. And uh, I'm, I'm living proof of that. So now it just has new names. So what? Go forth and be sustainable. That, that's probably one of my main messages here. Um, for those who have probably seen buildings with LED and saying they were silver certified, that's an American Institute of Architects program. and, and not to be outdone, the um, Landscape Architects, ASLA, came out with the Sustainable Sites Initiative, or Sites, which is more landscape oriented rather than building. You've got RainWise, which is an SPU program um, encouraging efficient irrigation and conservation of water and green infrastructure and natural drainage systems are sort of interchangeable. It's all about uh, dealing with runoff and, and replacing pipes with swales and rain gardens. So all of these things are, are proliferating and, and are meant to encourage uh, the use of sustainable practices and ecological, using ecological principles. And even now it's being mandated by agencies and municipalities, which is, which is and, and those mandates and, and regulations are, are constantly evolving and changing as we know because this is a fairly uh, new thing to a lot of people, not so much to me, but to a lot of people. So we're still figuring a lot of this, how to do this best in terms of the urban development out. So anyway, do not be daunted. Um, you can always be sustainable. And really when it comes right down to it, it's all about water. 
and specifically the urban water and we're how we're polluting it. Long, it's been quite a while since most of the point source pollution people, the, the industries and the ports and all that have been dealt with. Right now, the biggest threat to our natural water bodies, and this is big for Puget Sound, is urban runoff, urban stormwater runoff with hydrocarbons and heavy metals and all the junk that gets washed off of roads and parking lots and even roofs. So that's a big, big deal. And it's a hard problem to solve. So that is why the focus is so laser beamed onto these low impact development stormwater treatment type facilities to deal with our urban runoff quantity and quality of it. And also to conserve water. We're experiencing higher highs, lower lows, less snowpack, and we're dependent on snowpack for our drinking water. So conserving water in this region has always been an issue and will be increasing as our climate continues to get to change. I mean, yesterday was a point, I mean, I've never seen a downpour like there was yesterday. So we're getting more de heavier rains instead of the more even, even drizzles. Things are in flux. So the landscape industry actually can have a very significant um, impact and uh, contribution to low impact development and water conservation through efficient irrigation systems or maybe even no irrigation system or even just temporary irrigation system to get a native plant habitat uh, established and then you're done. Putting in less thirsty lawns, more natives and drought tolerant plants. Putting on site, and it's been proven that treating, treating runoff closest to the, close to the source is the most efficient way to deal with it. That's why rain gardens and bioswales and green roofs that take care of the drainage on a, a specific site are so important. And then going organic in maintenance, landscape maintenance using IPM. On to the next slide. So how do plants contribute? So this is all sort of reinforcing what Catherine uh, was talking about with LID. But plants are a big part of the hydrologic cycle. When you think about it, I mean, when the rain falls, what do they do? They absorb rain, they, they filter it, they detain it, they transpire it. They even intercept it before it reaches the ground. I mean, where do you stand when it rains? Under a big evergreen tree. Those are like sponges in the sky that release the rain more slowly. So that's detention in, a, in another sense. So this all helps to slow the water down, filter it, and that's what we need to restore and clean um, this whole cycle. Our, our paving over the earth has caused so much of this problem. So plants have a huge role in, in low impact development. And the use, of course, of drought tolerant native plants conserves water, reduces irrigation, and plants in general um, help to reduce the heat island effect, save energy and water. And one that I forgot to put on the list is they also improve air quality. <clears throat> so plants are a good thing. Let's go to the next slide. Talking about our precipitation patterns, yesterday being kind of an odd thing here on the west side with the big downpours and hail and everything else yesterday, I wanted to show people a comparison from different parts of the world. A lot of our ornamental plants here come from Asia or from southeast USA because there are somewhat comparable climates in those places. but not comparable rainfall. I think a lot of people who are native to western Washington in particular don't realize that most places in the world, most of the rain falls in the summer. And it's just the opposite here. You can see if you look at the, the uh, sort of off green uh, column, which is the summer, June through September, the huge peak in Beijing, China, which is the monsoon season. So they have a huge amount of rainfall in the summer. Columbia, South Carolina is a little more evenly distributed, moderated throughout the year with peaks in the early summer and winter and actually low points in spring and fall. And then you go to Seattle at the bottom and it's just the opposite. There's, I mean, we have this big trough of almost no rain from June through September. Sometimes our droughts, as, as we've experienced, go into October where you know, there's three or more months with really very little precipitation. So what does this mean if you plant ornamentals in the Northwest Pacific Northwest environment? Let's go to the next slide and find out, but think about it for a minute. What does this, what does this result in? Well, did anybody come up with this answer? 
supplemental summer watering needed to meet ornamental plant needs, of course, because these plants are not adapted to our Pacific Northwest uh, low summer rainfall pattern. So that is one of the, I think, primary reasons Pacific Northwest native plants are, are really great. They're not only adapted, of course, to the precipitation pattern, but climate in general and their soils, which tend to be low fertility, glacial till, you know, outwash sands and gravels. So they, it reduces the need for watering, for fertilization, pest control, um, and meets those goals of LID for water conservation, uh, reducing chemicals in the maintenance, uh, et cetera. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the big, the big response that comes, next slide please, the, oh, there's a poll going on. Sorry, let me, let's pause here for a minute. I'm rushing ahead, but please take the poll. Please take the poll. And as you're taking the poll, some of you may also be thinking, but our native plants are so limiting. All right, I'll let everybody take the poll, poll yeah. and then I'll tell you why our native plants aren't so limiting. <laughs> Should we wait for a minute? No, yes. Okay, so let's go on ahead. Um, we're not Kansas here. We have an enormous range of habitat types in western Washington and even into eastern Washington, going from seashore to alpine mountain slopes. I mean, it's, it's an incredible range of niches and, and habitats. I think when most people think native, they're, they just focus on our climax evergreen forest, the hemlock forest. So they're thinking huge, huge trees, wild and woolly, great big monstrous plants, deep dark shade, you know, it just doesn't fit in an urban area unless you've got acres and acres. Well. It's not exactly true because we have so many other lesser, they may take up less amount of acreage, but they are equally important. And I've pictured here some of the subalpine plant community species. Um, so the real, the real key here is to get a little, think a little broader, break out of the box and start thinking about those other, and learn about the other uh, native plant communities that exist, so give you a chance to kind of look at some of these, get inspired by some of these beautiful plants. There are some amazing um, natives out there that are naturally compact, um, naturally dwarf because they live in these more severe uh, climes such as subalpine and alpine, uh, serpentine soil areas. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, you know, very droughty. Uh, glacial outwash sands and gravels like western Washington prairies, which there's some great examples south of Tacoma, uh, and also the Mima Mounds, if you've ever been down south of Olympia. So what, we, what we're hoping today to encourage you all is to increase your knowledge of Pacific Northwest plants. But to do so, I would recommend learning about the plants by plant communities versus just individual species like, like flashcards. And be, why do I say this? Because a in a plant community, you really learn about a whole basket full of plants <laughs> that grow naturally together. And for those who don't know what a plant community is, I've got a very simple uh, definition at the bottom that these are plants that coexist or grow together in a shared habitat or environment. And a similar uh, type of phrase is a plant association. So learn about plant communities in, in, in that way, you sort of learn the conditions first and the plants that go with those conditions next so that it's right plant, right place, but it's native oriented. Um, and so many of these plant communities really can, can transfer from where they naturally occur, say subalpine or wet meadows, to things like rain gardens or bioswales because the environmental conditions are similar. Okay, same thing with, say, western Washington prairie oak, savanna, serpentine, very droughty, could be great for roof gardens or really dry, thin soil, poor soil places, and we've got plenty of those in the urban environment. So let's go on to the next slide. So be inspired. Can you visualize that beautiful prairie as a green roof? Next. Next, please. Oh, 
Oh, it's slow. Okay. There we go. So the other thing I'd encourage is to stock up your library and set your bookmarks. There are a ton of great resources out there that um, you could learn about native ecosystems. Uh, the, the Bible from the 1973 era is Franklin and Durness Natural Vegetation Oregon and Washington. It's a great start. It's very technical. Arthur Krugerberg, Professor Emeritus from the UW, has a couple books out that are great. There's an older book that's been reprinted several times by Eugene Kozloff that links the plants to the animals, which is cool if you want to focus on wildlife and bringing habitat for wildlife back into the city. Um, the Washington Native Plant Society website, which has several chapters, including on Eastern Washington Spokane chapter, and they have some great resources on, on their website, including um, a manual by Charles Anderson that was sponsored by Seattle Urban Nature. It's now hosted on the, on, on the Washington Native Plant Society site. And last but not least, I found an interesting group called the Northwest Habitat Institute that actually has pages, separate pages on, on all these various native habitat types and describes them and uh, encourages people to go find seed sources from these kinds of sites to use in urban conditions. So it's all about you know, grow, find, finding the great plants to start growing and making available. And, and more and more of these plants are becoming available. When I started doing things in the 80s, very few pl people were growing native plants. And now there's quite a proliferation. If we go to the next slide, um, a huge number of people have started growing natives, and the selection is much higher. And I just have a link here to the King County listing, which I checked out, and it's really pretty complete and it's listed by, by uh, city. So you can check that out. And if you are a grower and not on this list or other comparable lists, boy, get on them, because I think people are really going to start using these things as resources to find um, suppliers for putting in these natives. So again, here's a serpentine soil plant community. I've been trying to throw in little tidbits to titillate you on, on the potential of, of native plants with the serpentine grass. And the serpentine, so uh, serpentine is a soil type. It's high in magnesium. It's very low fertility and very, very droughty. And uh, so you get a lot of really interesting dwarfish and uh, cool looking plants that can take really tough dry conditions tough plants. All right. So we'll move away. So I've been covering some of the dry land uh, things. So I'm going to, we're going to come and uh, here's a typical rain garden or bioswale section, which really ends up almost creating a mini topography that goes from dry to wet and something in between. So using a ecosystem or plant community approach like I'm trying to push here, um, if you start saying, okay, our top area, our top of slope is an upland zone, our sides are a transition, the bottom's wetland, you have different plant communities involved in each of those. And selecting that can add wonderful complexity and diversity. Rather than just throwing in a bunch of ornamental sedges and what you might normally, just push yourself to pick from these native plant communities to fit these specific conditions hydrologically. And uh, I think you're going to find that you end up with a much more interesting, diverse, and very attractive facility. And I am trying to do one for myself. Next slide. Um, I've been, I've had a little rain garden for a while, and I just enlarged it. Let's see if we can get get the slide up. I got a lot of pictures, so it takes a while for these to come up. So this is in progress, and I am always experimenting, and I encourage others to always be experimenting and trying things. So this is my current plant uh, list for what's in, and, and I don't have my mulch in yet, and I haven't trimmed the, the pipes or whatever, but I have a couple downspouts coming in, and I've got uh, calamia, and, uh, which is the bog laurel, and fox sedge in the bottom with some deer fern. There's a, a white flowering uh, shooting star that you can see sort of left of center. There I've got... Uh, Sedalcia hendersoni, which is the Henderson's checker mallow, is a very good plant. So uh, there's a nice selection of, 
of, of plants here to give year-round color because this is intended to be a real focus of, of my garden. It's right off the back patio, very visible from the house. So it's not some utilitarian, ugly, hidden feature. It's really a highlight of, of the yard and intended to be a, a great for the year-round. So I'm still playing with it and adding to it. And I've got plants in this garden that come from bog or wet meadow or, or riparian or and uh, habitat subalpine habitat, uh, which is the, I've got an azalea, the native azalea, western azalea, which is a fabulous plant, very fragrant. Um, and the upland, I've got a baby uh, Gary Oak in the background, along with the, the big green leaves in the back is um, Cranby, which is not native and is outgrowing the space. And if anybody wants it, please contact me. It's free. <laughs> So uh, I'm trying to go all native here and really enjoying the process. And it's actually getting more ornamental with the natives, not less. The ornamentals were much less successful. Let's go to the next slide. And, and these next several slides are really just plant picks uh, on things that I'm trying in rain gardens and bioswales and you know, looking at for my own uses and have used. And it's their tip of the iceberg. I mean, we don't have enough time today to really sink into the, the mass of potential out there because I think there is massive untapped potential out there in our various native plant communities. But camas, uh, the Gary Oak uh, savanna prairies, uh, great for potential for both rain garden and roof, roof gardens. Here's a shrub tan oak, which I have a, a baby one in my rain garden in the upland. Uh, growing in its uh, natural condition, the siskiyous on serpentine soil. Nodding onion is a wonderful broadleaf evergreen, um, herbaceous. I think the herbaceous and subshrub shrub uh, categories of our native plants are, are probably the richest uh, fields to mine in terms of uh, use in the urban area. And, and again, just is just starting to see all of these things become available. Let's hit the next slide. So these will just continue to titillate you here with beautiful pictures. See if we can get the slides to go. I've got a lot of pictures, so it takes a little while. Be patient. There we go. So here we move to wetland, uh, bog or forested wetland. Again, this is the bog laurel, Calmia microphylla variety, um, occidentalis, and uh, Bog rosemary, there's some wonderful, we have wonderful bog plants, and people are growing these. Labrador tea and, and uh, the more ubiquitous deer fern, that's been out there for a while. All, all again, naturally dwarf, very ornamental, broadleaf, evergreen. Let's flash through these a little quicker. And continuing with more wetland uh, communities, the forested wetland riparian subalpine. The western azalea, which I mentioned, which is actually the parent of a lot of ornamentals, but why go to the ornamental crossbreeds when you've got such a great native to, to work with? Uh, Subalpine spirea is a real, there's also a um, upland naturally dwarf spirea called uh, birch leaf spirea, <coughs> spirea betulifolia, that are naturally dwarf, only get two to three feet tall, really useful in, in various. Uh, urban areas. I mean, in the urban area, you do have to worry about visibility and size and safety and all that kind of stuff. And small sites demand smaller plants. So these, that's what I'm trying to picture here. California Bay Dwarf Farm has a dwarf farm that's really cool. Um, and the swamp current, which again is a fairly dwarf, gets to about maybe two to four feet, is, is a pretty cool little gooseberry uh, native current for wetlands. Let's go on to the next. <clears throat> I'm using a lot of checker mallow in uh, rain gardens. They're, they're really quite showy, but native. And Oregon iris is another one. These are wet meadow plants. Uh, the various shooting stars, I picture mine, the white shooting star here, the dentatum. There's also Hendersonii and other ones. And then fox sedge. And there's several uh, good sedge, native sedges that are far better than the ornamental sedges at dealing with the rain garden swale conditions of being saturated at times and then dry much of the time. And fox sedge is a good one, and there are others which will be coming up here. Tufted hair grass, which people may know, is another wet meadow plant. 
big-headed sedge has got great potential for rain gardens. It's actually an upland sedge, can deal with a lot of drought, um, so it has great potential. It's very ornamental. And then I've tried a lot of other emergents in um, various swale projects I've done, and the, the Pacific silverweed doesn't, doesn't sound, have a very pretty name, but it's a potentilla, low-growing, and it's a great little plant for wetland conditions. And then many of our rushes are actually have iris-like leaves, and the dagger leaf rush is one of those. So I'm going to kind of conclude. This is, we're going to kind of wrap it up here. I'm back to this sort of typical section as sort of a summary slide, and it's in the very last page here before the final slide is, is a plant list. This section, I'll just give you a little background, was developed for Seattle Public Utilities for a manual called Practical Easy Landscape Maintenance, a uh, homeowner's guide to maintaining natural drainage systems. But it has much wider distribution because it really applies to any, establishing any native landscape. Unfortunately, the plant list associated with this uh, graphic in the practically had a lot of ornamentals on it. it. had some natives, but it was also ornamental because the planting was being done by um, the city itself, and it was through SDOT, and they're still stuck on ornamentals, amazingly enough. So on the very last slide, if we go to that, I took that list that we had in the Practically Easy Landscape Maintenance, and I played a little game, and I took took the ornamental parts and replaced it with uh, natives, comparable or better natives, and actually expanded on it. And they're coded by U, T, and W for upland zone, transition zone, and wetland zone. So they relate to that section. And it's, not, it's expanded from what was in the manual. It is not exhaustive. I mean, you, I, you can never stop learning about native plants. You can never stop adding to your palette of native plants that you use. And hopefully, the growers will never stop adding to their list of what they grow. So with that, I'm going to uh, take it to a close and, and turn it over to Len, because he's going to talk about growing all these great things. Thanks, Len. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I'm really excited. This is the first day I've, I've had a chance to meet Peggy. And I think our uh, conversations are going to go way into the future, because uh, <coughs> I have a huge interest in in growing, really. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm horrible because I, I tell a lot of stories and, and drives my wife crazy sometimes. But um, my first experience in growing was, I remember my, my grandma Sanders, she always had beautiful flowers and she always, always had a nice lawn. Well, she had geraniums on her back porch and I noticed one day there was some lawn seed setting on her back porch also, and I thought, well, that would look really pretty if there was log growing underneath those geraniums. And so within about two weeks, uh, my grandmother called my mom and said, we need to talk to that boy, and she had a beautiful crop of lawn inside of her geranium plants. Uh, uh, going on from there, I worked in my other grandma and grandpa's uh, truck farm for many years. Uh, my my dad ran, uh, was a greenhouse foreman for Holly Sugar, uh, uh, egg research station, so I worked in greenhouses starting from when I was about 12. I uh, got a degree in forestry and spent a lot of time in doing ecological type work, uh, really learning native plants and, and habitat typing and so on. Uh, in 1987, I helped found uh, Bitterit Restoration and worked there for just about 20 years uh, pr producing native plants and doing uh, restoration projects. And then I came to work at, at Herrera Environmental Consultants and have really been in, enjoying being able to actually do designs that I'm pleased with. I spent a lot of years doing designs that someone else put together that um, I wasn't real happy with. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so. I have a real personal interest in nursery production and native plants. On, on the left, that's some bulrushes that I was really proud of. Those were planted from seedlings in a, in a constructed wetland, and those are just a year old. Um, in the right photo there, it's, it's me as uh, uh, the greenhouse laborer for my wife's little greenhouse business. Uh, so even though I love native plants, I also like tomatoes. Uh, next slide. 
let's see, did we have a poll there of who grows native plants? Oh, do you grow more than 10 native plants? Okay, so yeah, basically this is an outline of what we're going to talk about, natives versus non-natives, and I think Peggy addressed a lot of that. I'm going to kind of emphasize some more. I'm going to talk about seed sources, uh, which has been really something in my restoration project that I've noticed the real importance of it. Then for you folks who are nursery people out there, the challenges of growing native plants, and there are a lot of challenges. Uh, the types of plant stock that can be used, uh, resources that you may need for really expanding out your native plant growing, uh, and then my idea of, of some wider variety of natives. And again, I'm going to get together with Peggy and we're going to combine these lists. And then just some final thoughts about uh, uh, growing native plants and what I think are the real opportunities for, for you guys out there. Okay, so it looks like quite a few people have been growing quite a few natives. That's, that's exciting. Okay, let's start out first with um, natives versus non-natives. <clears throat> and go ahead to the, to the next slide. First, I'm going to start talking about why utilizing natives. And Peggy talked a lot about that. One thing that, that I think is really important is to preserve our natural heritage. You know, for example, and I think Peggy alluded to the the uh, oak, savanna, oak savanna plant communities here in, in the Puget Sound. They're very beautiful and they're, they're disappearing from development, from uh, fire protection, and just from, uh, from people not wanting to see those dry areas. Um, providing habitat for, for birds, wildlife, and native pollinators, and this is something that's just come up recently and it's really important, is there's a uh, Disaster happening with honeybees, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, growers of of fruits and so on are, are depending on natural pollinators now for uh, pollinating their their crops. Uh, you know, filberts, uh, peaches, all can be pollinated really well by native pollinators. But you need to have the habitat for those native pollinators. Um, native plants are becoming more popular with home homeowners. Peggy talked about the 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 dry summers that you have here, and the dry summers that you have here are similar to those dry summers that are that happen in the in the uh, southwest. You know, for example, in Denver, uh, xeriscaping is is a real big thing. There's such a lack of water in the summer times that they are going to native plants for uh, xeriscape, not zero scape. I mean, they're still beautiful, but they're they're mostly native plants. And then what well, the reason that we're really here is that native plants are recommended for LID application uh, by regulators. So let's go to the next slide. So why do we go away from non-natives? Um, well, non-natives generally require a lot more intensive input of fertilizers, pesticides, and maintenance. And that's what we want to get away from. That's what LID is all about, reducing that input. Um, so uh, we that makes it a lot uh, a bigger reason why to, to stay away from the non-natives. They're not adapted to those harsh conditions, so you do have to, to take care of them more to, to get them to survive. Uh, they can become invasive because of lack, lack of natural controls. And here, here I go telling stories again, but <clears throat> I had a call years ago from this, this German gentleman, and he was really interested in uh, uh, creeping Oregon grape. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty neat. You know, why are you interested? And he said, oh, it's a horrible invasive plant. And people in Germany had introduced those in their yards, and it was growing out into the forest, and it was impeding the growth of, of uh, tree seedlings. I mean, Oregon great. But that really got me start thinking about, you know, what really is an invasive plant. The other thing is non-natives result in a loss of, of habitat and uh, biodiversity. And uh, let's go to the, the next slide here. And I'm not going to read this, but this was a study that was done in 1999. And at that point, they figured that environmental damages of non-native plants in the United States was about $138 billion per year. And then the other thing that was interesting is about 42% of the species, of the plant species on our threatened and endangered species list are at risk because of non-indigenous species. 
and you know, I flew in this morning from uh, from Missoula, Montana, and and landed here in Seattle. And as, as the plan was, like, plane was landing, I was looking out and I thought, wow, isn't that beautiful? Look at all that yellow stuff. And it's Scott's broom everywhere. And that's areas that all could be in natives, and, and there's some beautiful native plants here. So I'll quit preaching here, and let's let's go on a little bit further, a little bit deeper in, in importance of seed sources. Uh, natives are not necessarily just natives. For example, if you took um, uh, seed from a Douglas spur from Montana and grew a seedling, brought the seed over here, grew the seedling here, and planted the Douglas fir here. Same species, same tree, but not the same tree. What would happen is that plant is tied to its local climate. In other words, it would break bud in the spring when it thought it was time to grow, which is already after there's six weeks of growing time here. And then it would set a bud in the fall about six weeks before it should here. So you'd have a tree that would not reach to its potential because of that. Um, so plants are uh, uh, tied to their local climates. They also have natural resistance to local diseases and insects, and sometimes we don't even really know what those diseases or insects might be because we can't know all the genetics of a plant. Uh, they provide habitat and food in the critical seasons. You know, uh, it, uh, back to the pollinators may require those the, the, the plants to be uh, fruiting or blooming at the right time. There's fruit that comes on at the right time for, for uh, uh, migratory birds. And then the other thing is, is to prevent contamination of the local gene pool. Um, and, and that's kind of, a, kind of a, a little bit more difficult thing to think about. But imagine that Douglas fir from, from eastern, from Montana, putting pollen out here in western Washington, and all of a sudden you have trees that aren't as well adapted to conditions here. So let's go to the next slide, please. So to try to decide what is the appropriate uh, range of seed. In here, if you look in the upper uh, left-hand corner, um, you see the number two in Puget Lowland. Lowland. You can't really see the lettering. But that area in, it's in the blue there is, is the ecoregion that the EPA has said is probably appropriate for moving seed sources back and forth within this region. Now, that's just kind of a rule of thumb to start looking at because, for example, wetland plants that grow in the Pacific Flyway, whether they're in Canada or Washington or Oregon, or California are probably all the same genetics because they're moved back and forth by birds. However, oaks, Gary oaks grown here in, in King County are not the same as the Gary oaks that are in uh, Oregon because they're moved by, by rodents or they just fall out of the tree. So, so I, I show this just as a, as a rule of thumb, but to get people thinking, in other words, you don't want stuff from eastern Washington, seed sources from eastern Washington to, to grow here. And, and the other ways around, for you folks that are in eastern Washington, you don't want to use uh, seed sources from, from out here because they're not going to be adapted to the, the droughty conditions that you have there. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of challenges in growing native plants. And let's just go to the next slide. And, and, and I want to talk about some of those. Um, there's challenges, but, but there's a lot of really smart people out there, and, and you folks that have been growing for years have the tools to be able to do that. Just a little more information, and you can do a lot more growing. Um, first off, let's, let's do a, um, another poll here in that, are you familiar with the terms stratification and scarification? And I'm going to start out with native plants are not like tomatoes, and uh, because native plants are a lot smarter than tomatoes. Um, imagine a tomato, the fruit falls on the ground, you don't harvest it, it falls on the ground, and then the seed works its way into the soil, 
And sure enough, what will happen is that tomato seed will germinate. And then everything is fine. The tomato plant is growing. And all of a sudden, it gets to the fall. And what happens? It gets frosted, and it dies. That's a, that's a dump plant. But imagine a choke cherry. The seed falls at the same time of year, but it has germination inhibitors in the fruit, and it requires cold, wet temperatures for a certain amount of time. And it goes through the cold, wet temperatures, and guess when it germinates? It germinates in the spring, where it has the whole summer to grow, go through its whole process, set a bud, and be dormant and woody through the next, through the next winter. So each species has its own requirements for it to germinate at the right time, grow at the right time, and, um, and then there's also some, some hard-seeded species that allow them to, for seed to persist in the soil for a long period of time and then germinate uh, uh, when the conditions are right for it to germinate. There's also light-dependent species. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to talk a little bit about seed stratification here in this next slide. Looks like quite a few people know about stratification and, and scarification. That's great. Well, let's, let's move on to this. This is uh, uh, stratifying uh, Nootka Rose. Uh, one thing that I want to step back for just a minute is I've heard people say this, oh, well, stratification is you put the seed in the freezer. Well, that isn't the truth. What it needs is cold and wet, and you need to keep it in good conditions. Here, um, we used stratification, meaning basically putting in strata. We have a, a layer of seed within bridal veil bags, soaked, and then between layers of damp peat moss and uh, a ventilated container, and then there's, it's rinsed off, and, and then you get through the period of time that it needs it. I just had a real exciting uh, uh, discovery with my own. In the, in the Bitterroot Valley where I live, the Bitterroot is, is a beautiful little plant that has tiny, tiny seeds, and it's, it's really a diff, kind of a difficult plant to grow. Well, I collected some seed this last year, and I just realized I had it in the refrigerator, and then I read about the germination of it. This, is, this was about March, and they said, oh, well, what you need to do is you seed it in the ground in the fall, and then the next spring you watch for it, and then when it, when it comes up, you can, can uh, take the seedlings and, and transplant them. Instead, I put it in damp paper towel and put it in a plastic bag and put it in the, in the refrigerator. And I had it in there for about 45 days, and when I unrolled it and seeded them out, I had almost 100% germination. So I've got about 15 little, little bitterroot seeds growing, seedlings growing right now. Let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Scarification. Hard seeds. How do you break the seed coat down? You can use a rock tumbler. I've heard of people sanding uh, uh, seeds that, were, that are hard seeded. As a matter of fact, I, one of my hobbies is growing giant pumpkins. And giant pumpkins, they have a real hard seed. And if you, if you sand the edges of those pumpkin seeds, they'll, they'll break through the seed and germinate a lot better. Uh, I've never used a rock tumbler, but let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about something that's another method but is a little more dangerous. Acid scarification. <clears throat> concentrated sulfuric acid. You take concentrated sulfuric acid, put the seed in it, and then wearing at that time a face mask, apron, rubber gloves, the whole thing, and make sure you know about regulation of, of, of that material. And basically what you have to do is keep taking samples out of that seed, rinsing it, and then seeing whether that seed coat is, is broken down enough to be able to, uh, uh, to, to absorb moisture. Let's go to the next slide here. And you can see uh, some examples of some germination requirements. You know, birch has to have light. So you can't bury birch seed. It has to be right on the surface. Red osier dogwood has cold stratification requirements, 90 days. Nuka rose, about 90 days. Snowberry, if you're going to grow snowberry from seed, you scarify the seed, then you put it in warm stratification, room temperature, wet, for 30 to 60 days. Then you take it and you put it in cold stratification for 120 to 180 days, and then you'll get some germination. The truth is, is I don't do that with snowberry. I'll use little cuttings instead. But I, that's an example of, of just the, the, the difficulty. Um, there at the bottom, uh, seeds of woody plants of North America. I would suggest anybody that wants to grow native trees and shrubs uh, purchase that. I got mine through Amazon. I got a used one for pretty cheap. 
and there's I think there's a new issue out now, Seeds of Woody Plants of North America by Young. Um, but if you don't want to get into all of this stuff to try to get the seeds to germinate, there's a lot of really good nurseries around that grow native plants into bare root or seedlings. And you can purchase bare root or little container seedlings and, and uh, uh, grow them on in your nursery. And that's a good way to start growing native plants, really. Go to the next slide, please. So once you get the slide germinated. <laughs> germinating. It's germinating. There we go. Once you, once you get your plants germinated, then you have to figure out how to grow the darn things. There's widely different water usage. Uh, there's, there's day length issues. For example, that little choke cherry that, that we germinated a while back, it grows while day lengths are getting longer. When the day lengths start getting shorter, guess what it does? It sets a bud and it stops growing. We had a whole greenhouse one time of little choke cherry plants that were two and a half inches tall. And we had a client that was, was wanting to buy them and we couldn't sell them. So you have to deal with the day length. The, a lot of plants are dependent upon soil microorganisms, and we'll talk about that some more. Uh, and then there's a lot of disease problems from growing plants in, in moist environments, more moist than what they're used to. Okay. Um, one way of dealing with the difference in irrigation needs is to, to, to modify your soils or your, your growing media for different species. For example, if you're growing sedges and rushes, you want to have a real peat soil that is fine textured and will hold a lot of moisture. If you're growing something like, uh, like bitter brush or uh, uh, another dryland type species, you would use uh, well-drawing media that, that may have a bunch of perlite in it or sand or something like that, so it would, it would drain well. <clears throat> the other thing you can do is to group it's always important to group those plants according to common water needs. Have a, tr of, of a table of uh, dryland species, a table of wetland species, and then sometimes you may need to prevent overwatering by putting, uh, for example, if you have a wetland species table next to a dryland species, you may need to put up a plastic uh, shield to prevent overwatering because we've lost plants in the past from from just overwatering, uh, inadvertent overwatering. Um, a really good technique is these programmable irrigation booms, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later that will allow you to, to really control the water. For a small grower, and even for a large grower, sometimes just hand watering the small lots is a way to go. You know, you just get in, you know how much water you need. A good way to do it is to just lift the container and feel how heavy it is, and that way you can tell whether you've got enough water in it or not. Next slide. So beneficial soil microorganisms. So let, here, let's have another little poll. Uh, the term mycorrhiza. How many people are familiar with the term mycorrhiza? Um, here is, is a kind of a list of some beneficial soil microorganisms. There's a there's a soil mycorrhiza. There's there's rhizobium. There's frankia, and then there's a bunch of other organisms. Mycorrhiza. The term mycorrhiza really means uh, fungus root. And what it is, is it's an association really between a plant and a fungi. In the bottom left hand corner there, you see a little pine seedling, a bottom photo. The root system of that little pine seedling is about the same size as that top. All the rest of the white stuff out there that looks like roots, that's mycelium from a, a mycorrhizal fungi that has, quote, infected, colonized that plant. The fungi doesn't have, have uh, chloroplasts, so it can't get food from, from photosynthesis, so it gets its food from that plant. And in return, that fungi expands the root system out of that plant, sometimes as much as 500 times, that will allow it to take up nutrients and water better. Wow, it looks like we got like 60% of the folks uh, knowing about mycorrhiza, that's great. It's really an important thing, both in the field and, and in the nursery. Uh, in the nurse, in the field, 
if you look at the upper right hand corner photo there, uh, the gentleman that, that's sitting there on his right, our left, is a row of choke cherries that were grown in a nursery from a specific seed source that were not inoculated with mycorrhiza. On his left, our right, was the same seed source, grown in the same nursery, grown at the same time, and inoculated with mycorrhiza. So not only did you get incredibly better growth, if you look on the left side there, our left, they lost a bunch of those seedlings. This was, this was a study done at the um, uh, Montana State uh, Montana State University Ag Research Station uh, in Corvallis, Montana, right up the hill from, from where I live. Uh, in my restoration projects anymore, I, I specify mycorrhizal inoculation and verification of actual colonization for all my projects, and, and we have way a lot better success. Here's the good story for growers. It costs money to do the mycorrhizal inoculation in the nursery, and it's kind of a pain because you have to be careful with too much fertilizer, you have to be careful with, you can't be using fungicides, but guess what? Everybody knows what a cull rate is. You grow lots of plants, and then you go through and you pull out all those that die out of the trays, and you may have 15, 20, in the native plants you may have as much as 50%. The nurseries that I've worked with that are, in, that are inoculating their seedlings in their nurseries are dropping their cull rates down to like as low as 5% or even less. So they're actually growing plants higher quality plants at a cheaper price, making them more competitive. Just real quick words about rhizobium. People that grow peas and beans in their garden, you buy the, the inoculum to inoculate those. But also, lupins are, are legumes, and there's a lot of other legumes that if you inoculate with rhizobium, they'll do a lot better. Frankia is one of those uh, microorganisms that's wonderful because there's lots of, of, of uh, spores in the air, and so anytime you grow a birch or alder, if you pull the roots out and look at it, they'll almost all be colonized with, with branchia. So it's, it's one of those do-it-yourself. We don't have to mess with it. Except that if you're using too much fungicide or too much fertilizers in the nursery, you can impede those. And then there's all kinds of other organisms that kind of live along with the mycorrhiza when you have those in the, in the uh, plantings. Um, okay. Let's go to types of plant stock going to talk about, uh, and we can go ahead and, and on to the next slide here, and because we'll start talking about individuals. There we go. Traditional nursery containers. Uh, widely available, everybody uses them. Uh, WashDOT specs them in on all their projects. Um, there's a few problems. One, they have problems with root spiraling. They have a real poor to root to shoot ratio. For example, a one gallon, a one gallon traditional nursery container is about eight inches deep. Imagine a two foot tall plant on top of that. Now we're putting it into a situation like Peggy pointed out is midsummer with very, very little moisture. So what do we do? We put a drip system on it, we water it. It costs about four times as much as if we had planted a plant with a deeper root system that would reach the water. Uh, so the other part is, is you have this great big tall plant that is transpiring all this moisture and a root system that's only eight inches deep. So they're widely available, they are inexpensive, there's definitely a market for them and a lot of them are spec, but I would like to see people go into the deeper containers. And there's a lot of local nurseries, I know here in the Puget Sound area and in Northern Oregon, that are growing the, the deeper containers. Let's go to the next slide, please. Tubelings. Here's an example. Eight and a half inch deep instead of the eight inch. It's only an inch and a half in diameter. It's about a quarter of the cost of a one gallon, better survival, uh, really small initial top, but I've done, done projects where we planted one gallon and uh, tubelings, and in about four years you can't tell which was which, if you can get the one gallons to survive by watering them. Tubelings you don't have to. When I was at Bitter Restoration, we planted 
we planted plants in the Four Corners area of Arizona where they had two inches of precipitation a year. We planted those plants. Mycorrhizal, planted at the right time of year, tubelings, and we got 50 to 70% survival with no irrigation in two inches of precipitation a year. Go to the next slide, please. Wetland plants, uh, they can be grown in really small, inexpensive containers. I see a lot of wetland plants, sedges and rushes grown in one gallon. You can grow them in something as little as a three cubic inch container and get really good survival. And, and plant growing a lot of those species that Peggy was talking about. You can plant them through the middle of the summer. Um, they can do really well. The next slide. Bare rootstock. Bare rootstock can be really, really uh, uh, valuable and is a, is a great tool. It's great for reforestation. It's inexpensive. They're pretty easy to install. No problems with root spiraling. You do have to have good, consistent moisture. Uh, you do have to be really careful when handling those. For example, if you're planting in, in drier conditions, you need to have those wrapped in damp burlap and kept in the shade. And um, also, there's kind of a limited season of availability. It's really kind of spring is, is usually the limited season. There's a little window in the fall. But if you have projects that you have to plant in the middle of the summer, um, Again, what you could do is buy bare root stock, put them into one gallons, or put them into the deeper rooted containers and have those available for summer planting. Next slide, please. Uh, a real cheap way is with cuttings. Uh, the problem is that there's just a few species that work really well from cuttings. Um, willows, cottonwoods, dogwoods. I've had some good success doing those on projects out here in, in, on the, the west side. Uh, higher elevations, it doesn't work well because you don't have a long enough season to really get the roots developed. But um, there, it, it, is a, it is an opportunity that you might want to think about as an inexpensive way to get things like red osier dogwood um, or even some of the willows started. Uh, next slide, please. Fallen burlap is a traditional uh, big uh, yard tree. Again, for replacing, and, and that's part of LID too, is replacing or preser preserving the uh, native plants. So you may want to want to purchase larger native trees for for replacing those that have to have to be damaged. Gives you an immediate, immediate visual impact. The problem is they're difficult to work with. That gentleman that's working with that thing is probably a 250 pound ball. Uh, they're also pretty expensive, a couple hundred dollars once you get into any kind of size tree. And you can have some poor survival unless you really, really baby the things along. Here's, here's the other thing interesting. See that root ball? See that tree up there? The root system where that tree was growing in the ground was as big as that tree, it was as wide as the crown and as big as that tree. So when they dug the root ball, they cut down through the center and they cut off all the live roots on the outside. And so you don't have an active root system that's supporting that tree. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's a new innovative solution that's actually been working really well are these root control bags. They're a woven fabric that is really a tight weave. This plant is, is just being dug out of the ground. The roots, little feeder roots can go out through that, but as soon as they start expanding, it prunes the tips off and it causes a root flush in around the tree. They're easier to work with, less expensive, and, and better survival that, uh, than ball and burlap. Unfortunately, they aren't nearly as available as, as ball and burlap. But hopefully uh, people will start growing them. And I'd encourage any of you folks that are interested in that to, to, uh, to really take a look at it because I think it's a market that is really up and coming. Next slide. Plants for green roofs. I'm going to talk just really briefly about that. There are uh, deep-rooted, uh, intensive green roofs where the soil is more than six inches deep and extensive. Uh, where it's less than six inches, and, and these sedums are really those uh, the crown or uh, uh, crop stone crop. Stone crop. Thank you. <laughs> the stone crop plants uh, can do really well on uh, green roofs. Okay, let's go to additional resources and skills needed, and I'm going to skip through a lot of this. First off, staff. You need trained treatments. Treatment staff, seed treatment staff, learn about the beneficial soil microorganisms, integrated pest management, use chemicals if you need them, go to organic as much as possible, 
uh, and then track your seed sources. And let's go to the next slide and let's talk about photo period. Again, we talked about that, that choke cherry. This is a way you can keep the choke cherry growing. Very interesting because these aren't grow lights. All they do is they flash on for 30 seconds out of every half hour. They break the uninterrupted darkness. They, it isn't light. They've done some discovery that it isn't light that, that promotes plant growth. It's the, it's the breaking up of that uninterrupted darkness. Um, let's go to the next slide. Traveling Boone irrigation system, really good because you can have it set to where it'll put out a certain amount of water on certain trays, uh, less on others. You can also inject fertilizer, dependent on species by species. Next slide. Humidity, high humidity, you can control that by having good venting systems and fans, either automatic or manual, paying a, a real close attention to that. Uh, the next slide, please. And this is just a wider variety of native plants. Um, let's go on to the to the next one. These are these are a lot that I'm going to probably going to be comparing with Peggy here. And uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, some final thoughts. First off, the regulations requiring native plants are coming on. Right now, there is. The Forest Service has, actually has a native plant policy where they're requiring on their Forest Service projects to have native plants and local seed sources. We talked a little bit about green-minded people using natives here in the Pacific Northwest, your dry summers, save a lot of money on, on water. Um, climate change and water shortages are going to make it even more. And here's the big one. As a grower, if, if, if I won the lottery and started growing native plants again, I would, I would really be into it. Production of native plants will differentiate you from your competitors. If you know how to grow native plants, you're going you're gonna to have a real competitive advantage. Now we can go look at some pictures of pretty natives. This uh, Kinnikinnik Arctostaphylus uva ursi, I, I love this plant. Really good little ground cover uh, that will handle dry conditions. Next slide. Blue elderberry, real pretty one, nice fruits for birds. Uh, Beautiful blossoms, makes really good wine. Uh, <laughs> Cherrymaker's Bullrush, this is a really good one if you have a, a, a bioretention uh, area or somewhere where you have standing water all the time. I've seen this stuff grow and dry out almost, not droughty, but where you have moist soil and then you could have deep water, up to 30 inches of water and have it still survive. Next slide. Mimulus Lewisia, beautiful little purple monkey flower, I've seen it growing in, in Bogs where the water is just springing up out of the ground, and it just it's a beautiful flower. Next slide. Uh, mountain ash, and I think I saw that on your list. Sitka mountain ash. Sitka mountain ash. That's right. Not the not the European mountain ash. Nope. That's right. There is a non-native here. Yep. Yep. Next slide. And let's just go ahead through these slides and, and just take a look at how pretty they are. And that's how it can look in a rain garden. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I'm always willing to talk about native plants if anybody wants to give me a call or send me an email. Thank you, Len and Peggy. It's great. Um, so we're going to flash. This is Ruth again. And um, we're just. Um, wrapping up the presentations. If you have a question for us and want to use your chat um, bar on, on, your, um, on the drop down, you can go ahead and send us a question now. Um, we've got about 15 more minutes. And in the meantime, we've got a, the screen up right now is um, the information for the upcoming webinars, one on rain gardens and bioretention facilities on May 22nd. And these are evening webinars and then one on permeable paving on June 11th. 
Yes. Um, so another thing is that some, several people have asked about um, resources and the presentations, and we will be sending those to everyone who's attended. So um, within the next few days, anyway, we're we're um, we're also wanting to send a follow-up survey. So we're just we'll prepare that email out to everyone and send it your way soon. Yes, that's a good idea. We could also uh, probably post the presentations on the WALP and WSMLA website. So we'll work on doing that as well. That should work fine. Um, so you can also go there for more resources. So I'm just going to stand by for a moment, see if anyone has any questions. Um, both Peggy and Len are still here and certainly willing to fill in with more information. I think they did a great thorough job of their, you know, their task, which was to talk about all the plants for LID. So hopefully everyone learned something today and, um, you know, please let us know uh, if there was something you were looking for that you, that was not covered. We're certainly, um, would like to know that as well. This uh, Department of Ecology is just beginning these training programs for LID. As Catherine mentioned earlier, their uh, LID regulations will be coming on um, in 2015 through and phased in through 2018. Um, throughout Washington, really in, in Western Washington, LID will be required. And so this is just the beginning of ecology's work to make sure that all the professionals that would work with LID um, have the opportunity to learn more about it before those regulations are. Um, are out there. So, okay. I don't think we're having any questions. If there's anything in follow-up that anyone would like to ask, please uh, feel free to do that. And um, you can always go to either the WALP or the WSNLA website to learn more. I'll be posting information there. Thank you so much for participating today. Hopefully, we will um, hear from all of you again on May 22nd. All right, thank you.